Welcome to another edition of After Impact. I am your host, Tom Bilyeu, and I am here with the amazing, the incredible, the almighty Agent Smith, Mr. Bilyeu. What's up, homie? How's it going? Do you, do you think people know why I do that? Uh, I really hope so, but probably not. <laughs> it's from The Matrix. Have you seen the Indeed movie? Indeed it is. Agent Smith. Indeed. <gasps> We oh, haven't we put our have dudes out in a long time. What the fuck? <laughs> They're up there. This is madness. Cindy's you guys have entered it. madness. <clears throat> and I apologize for the lack of professionalism that mm. that is evidenced by our oh, lack right of there. little peeps. But Cindy, Cindy is to coming rescue. to the rescue indeed. All right, guys. Well, while Cindy makes us whole again, uh, we want to welcome you to the feed. We're going to be talking about Maria Sharapova today. And if you want to do the rest, because... That is right. Welcome to After Impact. This is the show where we unpack the impact of this week's episode with Maria Sharapova. Big, <laughs> big star. It's just amazing. Every time I think about it, I'm like, we had Maria Sharapova on the show. Yeah. I mean... Legit. Yeah. Big name, um, an awesome person, and it was really cool to have her um, here on set. And yeah, it was, great. it was a great interview, so we're going to dive into it. Um, guys, if you haven't seen the episode, highly encourage it. Um, and before we don't jump into that, I want to just mention for those of you who are on Facebook Live and YouTube Live, we're running a contest right now. The contest is uh, refer a friend to our YouTube channel and get them to subscribe. The prize, which I think you might be excited about, is we are going to fly you out from anywhere in the world to Los Angeles for a day to hang out with Mr. Bill Yu hey. and the Impact Theory team. Word. So it's a big prize. You get to come out here. We'll take care of flight. We'll take care of accommodations. And you just get to be here, learn from Tom, ask questions, any questions that you have, see what we're doing behind the scenes and really get a feel for what Impact Theory is all about. Indeed. And just to be really clear, um, the way the contest works is the more people that go and subscribe and then drop your name into the comments on that video, it's a very specific video, which we'll put in the comments here if you didn't already say that, uh, the more people that go there and put your name in the comments, the more chances or the more times you're entered into the contest. So you want to get yep. as many people as you can. You will notice there are a small handful of people that are getting a lot of love yes. from their uh, friends, family, followers. Uh, but it's pre been pretty amazing. And some of them had so many that I called bullshit. And I was like, I'm looking these motherfuckers up. <laughs> and like, I started going through. Yeah. They seem like real people. David Kim is one of them. David Kim's David had a Kim, lot of love. we see you. And then, oh, but oh, his last name sounds like three words put together. Uh, I can't remember it off the top of my head. But yeah. yesterday, he had just a gaggle of people. And I thought, for sure, this is a bot of some kind. Yeah. Doesn't seem like it. But yes, please get involved in the contest. Uh, please help us spread the word. That's what we're trying to do, grow our YouTube following. We have an internal number of 115K Correct. by the end of the month. It looks like we're way off from that. And yes. so deep but shame. But the contest, deep shame, yeah. well said. Yep. Uh, the contest keeps running for, it's three weeks total. So uh, we started it a few days ago. So uh, you've still got some time. But go rally those troops. Deadline is, I believe... The 13th of October. Sounds about yep. right. Is that a Friday? That's a Friday. Is it really? It's a Friday the 13th. That's hilarious. In October? In October. Come on. Now, Casey, does this make it like a, a religious holiday for her? Yes. Yeah, Friday the 13th in October. This is Casey's jam. Just a marathon. So it's madness. Friday the 13th. Okay. Let's dive into it. Maria Sharapova, I'm sure most of you know, uh, world famous athlete, um, also a great person. She just came out with a book, which we should get a copy of that. And we should, that. that should be sitting here. Will, can you and grab a copy? While we dig up that copy, I will say that uh, I'll just give this right to the A camera. She's also the highest paid female athlete, period. Like not wow. female tennis player, the female athlete. So this woman has done an incredible job of turning her success into success in multiple arenas. Very yeah, impressive. Yeah, really cool. And she also has a She's an entrepreneur. She has a company called Sugar Pova where yep. they make gummies and chocolate and all kinds of Thank tasty you, things. This is the book, Unstoppable. Um, I have not read it. Tom, you've read it. I have read it. Having read the book and getting a chance to sit down and interview Maria, what do you think it is about her that has made her such a dominant athlete? All right, I swear this was not a setup. I didn't know you were going to ask that question, but this is probably my favorite thing to talk about with her. This woman is... The title of the book is perfect. It is absolutely 
so descriptive of her. So at five and a half, she tore her fingernail off. She like, I don't know, stepped off a ledge or some, or a like curb or something and, and fell. And when she got up, she realized, oh shit, like there was blood everywhere. She's five and a half, dude. She's bleeding everywhere. And her dad's like, whoa, we have to get you back home. Your mom is going to have a stroke yeah. if I take you to practice. And she was like, absolutely not. Like, I want to go play. And I just thought, whoa, like, I, I wasn't like that until I was in my mid 20s. So, what for her, five and a half year old is like that, dude. I, I don't mean, know. you fall down and scrape your elbow and you're crying. Yep. And, and you just want cuddles. Yeah. And like, I was the king of that shit when I was a kid. Yeah. So, look, I am not a big believer in nature Ooh. at all. So, I really want to believe that somehow, some way, like her dad or her mom instilled like some steely Russian mojo in her yeah. um, versus it just being she was born that way. But I don't know, man. Maybe she was like, that's her predilection, like the yeah. way that she was. Because look, we all have a bent towards something. Now, what you do with that, to me, is the only thing that really matters. But it would be foolish to say that we don't have a bent in some direction. We're going to get early wins. So she clearly had early wins in just like mental toughness. And then she's built on that. And she talks a lot about that later, like always being younger than everybody. It really made her not try to attach to them for comfort or anything like that because she wasn't getting it because she never felt like she belonged and always felt like an outsider just because of her age. And so that and like when she first came, she didn't speak English. So like the mental toughness. And in the book, her coach talks about there's the game and then there's the game. Mm. And he said she was great at both. And the game and the game being she was good at the game of tennis. And then she was good at the game of like getting inside her opponent's heads mentally before they even walked onto the court. And dude, I love that so yeah. much. When people beat themselves before they even walk in. Do, do you follow MMA? I don't know. All right. Well, there was this guy. He's, he's still alive. I just don't think he's fighting anymore. But Anderson Spider Silva. And Heard of him. Watching this guy fight was unreal until it wasn't. But let's set that aside for yeah. a second. Like when he was in his prime, it was it was unreal. Like people came into the ring defeated. And they just thought, I can't beat this guy. And what I love, though, is it it started because everyone took him for granted. Nobody, like, he, he, I think he was in pride. Anybody that's a deep MMA fan will know. Like, but he was in something other than the UFC, and he was just, like, cleaning up. But then he came to the UFC, nobody knew who he was. So he was, like, the, the you know, the guy that, like, you're supposed to walk through to get to the next match, or that's how people thought of him. And he just came in and picked them apart. And it was so surreal to watch. And people used to say, why? Watching him fight, he must be in the fucking matrix because he'd like dodge your punch and then hit you like and didn't even look that hard. And people just like what? <laughs> and they'd crumple to the floor and you'd rewatch it going, I don't understand. Like he didn't hit him that hard, but he always hit you from some weird fucking angle that you didn't see coming right on the chin. And I remember watching footage of him train and he would like there would be a tennis ball instead of a punching bag. There'd be a Whoa. tennis ball and he'd fucking like wallop it. And it'd be moving really fast and he'd hit it. And I just thought, wow. All right, so that, like, when you get to that level and you can just decimate people because what you've done is impressive, your mental game is so strong that people are fighting themselves before the match even begins. And that, that, oh, that's so cool about her. Yeah. And just, like, hearing how she... And this was something I was so pissed when I was re-watching the episode for this After Impact... I was so pissed with myself that I didn't follow up on it in the middle of the interview. And it, for whatever reason, in the interview, it didn't hit me. And then re-watching it, it did. And that was when she says, oh, long before I was playing professionally, I was watching and listening to the commentary of people talking about the tennis players and what makes them great and what their attributes were and all that, which I should have pushed on to be like, basically watching tape, right? Yeah. So even as like essentially a little kid, she's like obsessing about the game of tennis. Interesting. And she was like, you know, I would watch them and I would listen and they would say, oh, they can um, hit high balls. They react really fast. They can slide well on the court because she was talking about clay courts. And she said, I didn't have any of those skills. And so she knew that the thing that was going to make her dominant was just outworking people. And you know my fetish for that. Yeah. I, I have yeah. an absolute all-consuming fetish with people that win by outworking. Yeah, you do. That's awesome. Yeah, I, that, I noted that too, is that when she said that she's this kind of intimidating force, or maybe you mentioned in the interview, and that people 
not only do people beat themselves before they've stepped in the court, but even if they're winning, she's like, I'm never going to give it to you. I'm never going to roll over. And I think that adds to that, <laughs> that, that mystique around yes. her, right? Yes. That she's going to fight to the last point, yeah. even if she's behind. Yeah. Love that. That's mental toughness, man. Yeah. When you're like, so if, if I were in her shoes and I can't say that this is what she's thinking, but from the outside, this is kind of how it feels. But if I were in her shoes, exactly what I would do is, okay, I'm losing. So now this is no longer about winning. This is about how do you build your mentality back in the moment to get back to a position where you can have the confidence. So even if like mathematically I can't make it happen, yeah. then I'm still going to practice that evolution of going from being in a mentally bad place to being in a mentally good place. And I remember giving the example before on camera when I interviewed, I think it was Noah Kagan. And I like fucked up in the beginning and I blanked on something and I was really trying to vamp to get back to it. And then the vamp went on so long that like everybody was really fucking uncomfortable. And I was like, okay, I'm now at a deficit. Cause we had like, let's say 30 people in the audience. I'm at a deficit and I can either clam up and shut down and curl up in the fetal position and just try to survive this interview. Or I can say, you know what motherfuckers? All right, I'm, I'm way behind the eight ball now. And I'm going to acknowledge it. And I actually said in the interview, because I don't even remember how it came up, but it was like somebody asked a question. He may have, because this was back when we used to take a lot of audience questions. Either they asked or he asked me, um, you know, like, what was the time where you made a mistake? And I was like, hey, you guys were here for it. And let me yeah. tell you what I was doing mentally. And my mental process was, all right, I'm way behind the eight ball. And now this is all about crawling back and mentally practicing, because that's one of the things people have a hard time is, how do you practice when the stakes are high? Yeah. So I'm going to practice because there's no, no such thing as performance. Everything is practice. That's how I look at it. So I'm going to practice now crawling from a deficit back to zero and then zero to extraordinary by the end of this interview. So even though it got off to a super rocky start, I didn't let it throw me off mentally. And that's what you see in her game. So if, if that were me, that would become that game of how do I reinstate my winner's mentality by the end of this? It's so, so powerful and something that I've learned from watching you because I feel like I've struggled with it and I know a lot of people struggle with it too. It's like you get into that state where all right, I made a mistake. This thing is ruined. Like there's no coming back. Right. But you, but you're really good at saying there's always time to come back. There's always time to build yourself back up or, uh, you know, just there's, there's a long timeline and you're not looking at it that way. A lot of times you're thinking of just that moment and it's gone forever. So yeah, that's so important, that. dude. And so the words that I've always mm -hmm. put around that are don't judge yourself through the lens of a moment because mm -hmm. in any one moment you can fuck up, right? It's right. that whole concept of any given Sunday. So on any given Sunday, you don't need to, like she says in the episode, you don't have to be better than everybody walking Every into the tournament, yeah. right? You just have to be better than the person across the net from you at that moment. That was awesome. It's a great thing. And I think she's quoting Andre Agassi, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. And so that whole concept of, all right, she was talking about sort of the positive side, right? Don't let them intimidate you because you only have to be better than them at that moment. Yeah. But then I'll also say to your point, like there's the flip side of that coin, which is if you fuck up, don't worry about it. Like yeah. the moment's going to be gone. And if you let that then deteriorate future performances because you're obsessively thinking about it and you let it somehow become a part of your identity and it says mm -hmm. that you're a worse player or whatever, then you really will be a worse player. I mean, yeah. it's ridiculous like how the mind works. Yeah. All right, um, guys, we have a lot to get through in this episode. If you have questions, please send them our way uh, so that Tom can dive into it regarding the episode. It look like, looks like we have a couple, so I'm going to jump nice. into it. First off, a couple shout outs. Don't know their names, but Brazil is in the comments, <laughs> Dublin. So, Sean, if you could include their names too. Uh, Brazil, Dublin, Trinidad and Tobago, and New York. Nice, in the house. All right, here's a question. I'm going to be in New York. Oh, by yeah. the way, so, and this is uh, next week, Thursday. looking in your eyes for confirmation. Uh, Thursday, we're doing an event in NYC. We don't have the exact location yet. Bear with me. Keep an eye on that IG feed, that Facebook page. We'll be announcing it, but we'll be doing a live meet and greet in New York next Thursday. Be there or be square. There's also the right to the RSVP. Nice. And that's on Facebook? So, it's in the comments to the Oh. There it is. Word up. All right. So RSVP. coming to you in the live feed will be exactly what you need to get the event right to go and register. Because we do. The reason we don't have the event is because or the location is we need to know how many people are coming. That'll determine which event, uh, location we go with. All right. There it is. All right. Here's a question from Jumani. 
our friend. Uh, Maria seems like a person that can take the hits. How can you develop a mindset that can take jokes, negative comments, and hard situations and almost laugh at them? Well, so it's interesting, this whole notion of practicing, there's no performance, it's all practice. Like in the beginning when somebody, if you're insecure and somebody taps into one of your insecurities, it is going to cause a neurological cascade yep. that is not pleasant. Yep. And what you have to do is go, okay, I'm going to practice not letting this make it to my face, mm -hmm. right? And as, and oh, I forget who said this, but they said uh, to, for, for you to become numb to something, first you have to go through it. I thought that's actually really interesting. Like mm -hmm. if you want to get numb to criticism, first you have to be criticized and you have yeah. to practice dealing with that. Yeah. So if that's your thing and people happen to click into an insecurity that you have, um, what you want to do is look at those moments rather than like a moment to defend your honor. It's a moment to practice not letting it even register on your face that it bothered you, which is usually the moment that you actually rob a bully of their power. So you either have to like be prepared to throw down, which is actually a pretty reasonable response to a bully or show that it just doesn't fucking bother you. So you'll have to decide case by case. Sometimes it really is a punch to the mouth is the only thing that's um, the appropriate reaction. But most of the time, the appropriate reaction is just it doesn't phase you. Mm -hmm. So practicing that, letting the sting happen, but very rapidly getting over that, letting it go, practicing not letting it bother you, really practicing just on a like physiological level that I'm not going to let this manifest in any sort of outwardly way. And that is something that you can practice. And so that's what I would do. I would just practice, practice, practice not run from the criticism, not obsess about it, but practice how rapidly can I really diffuse this mentally and emotionally so that it doesn't bother me. So even if, for instance, you keep it from reading on your face, but that night you fucking obsess about it and you can't sleep, like yeah. you're still losing. Yeah. So at that point, whether it's through a meditative practice, whatever you need to do, find other things that you're proud of in your life, or this is actually what I do, I go, how much of this is true? Oh, 80% of that's true. It's actually a well-placed bit of criticism. Fantastic. What I'm going to focus on now is thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. And I'm going to make changes. Now, I'm depending on the person, I may or may not acknowledge it to them because it may only fuel them mm -hmm. to be like, you're absolutely right. Especially in the early phases, as you get better at that, where it's really sincere and you actually are grateful for that, you can use it, but that's an advanced technique. Anyway, that night I would be like, this is actually real criticism and that's why it's bothering me so much. Because it's real and I know that I can get better and I don't judge myself through the lens of a moment, I judge myself through the lens of a lifetime, I'm not gonna feel badly about that. I'm not gonna waste time feeling badly because that doesn't serve me. Yeah. And the fact that I can get better at anything at any time and that it's all my fault, I'm in control and I get to like choose different, um, different ways to spend my time to actually acquire that skill, that really lowers that um, sense of weight or, or um, pain. I don't even, I don't know how to describe that emotion. Shame, like whatever that is, feeling badly about yourself. Mm -hmm. It instantly goes away from me when I remember, oh, I could get good at that if I choose to. That's awesome. What do you think about doing activities where um, you're completely out of your element, it's brand new to you, you have to have a beginner's mindset, you're going to fall down, look foolish, people are going to make fun of you, to develop that like thicken that skin against criticism man how very stoic of you so and by that i mean stoic philosopher i forget which one it was ryan holiday if you're in the comments uh <laughs> <I love Ryan laughs> holiday. as you so often are <laughs> um tell us who it is but there was one guy i can't remember who and he was uh, wealthy and well respected and so what he realized he had was a fear of losing all of that and so every so often he would, in fact, I may be conflating two stories. There was one guy who would dress ridiculously to remind himself that like people can judge you all they want, but like who you are is all that really matters. Mm -hmm. And then like who you are as a person. And then the other guy um, would go and live like literally on the street and he would mm -hmm. sleep on the street. He would have no worldly possessions for whatever period of time, a day or two days. And he said every time he did that, he would think to himself, this is what I'm afraid of. So it's like nobody's going to rush to that. It's not an ideal or optimized way to live. But when you force yourself to go through it, you really do come out the other side. And look, I haven't done that particular thing, but like not eating. You come out the other side going, yeah, okay, it just wasn't that bad. Yeah. So, And that I think is a really, really um, 
not easy, but direct and simple way to do what you're talking about, which is confront it, do it, practice it. And I think that it is very, very usable to thicken your skin, to recognize that um, almost that you don't even like need that thick of skin to deal with it. Yeah. It's just not that big of a deal. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, so at this point, you have interviewed several world-class athletes, both mm -hmm. on Impact Theory and Inside Quest. I'm just going to list off a couple names. So Michael Strahan, uh, Terrell Owens, Laird Hamilton, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, yeah. some really amazing athletes in all different sports. Uh, I want to ask, do you see any similarities between the way that Maria thinks and the way that these other champions think? Definitively. In fact, the one thing I will say, all the ones that you named, all of them, were the result of work ethic. Like these were people that just pushed and pushed and pushed yeah. and didn't stop and kept going and wanted to get better, always looking to improve. And that was the thing like really, really consistently. I mean, um, Terrell was a really cool example of like, dude, nobody thought I was going to be anything. Like I went to a remote college, like nobody wanted to draft me. Same with Strahan. Yeah. He went to the college that would take him that he could get a scholarship from. And like they, they were just hell bent to learn, to get better, to push themselves. And then my favorite story about Strahan, he watches the movie, The Matrix. This is how Strahan and I connected, by the yeah. way. So I bring up The Matrix and he was like, that's like my fucking favorite movie. That movie changed my life. And I was like, all right, you have to tell me how. And he said, so the year that I set the record for the most sacks was after watching The Matrix. And I realized I was holding myself back. That my belief that once I got one sack, I could never get a second one. He said that was stopping me. And then I said, wait a second. You know, do you think that's air you're breathing? He was like, that line just kept going in my head. And I realized just because I got one, why can't I get two? Why couldn't I get three? And so then that made him play with more aggression, made him play all the way through the game. He didn't relax when he got that first one. Yeah. And he said that that really changed everything and was how he ended up setting the record. And it's just like you hear that in all of them, not the reference to the Matrix, but like that sense of like coming to believe that they're capable of something as long as they're willing to work to attain it. Uh, that that that's what make the greats, man. Yeah. And look, there there's one exception that really fucks with all my rules, and that's Bo Jackson. And Bo Jackson was like, it just always came easily to me, and I hate that about him. I'm gonna be really <laughs> honest with you, I hate that about him. But he's interesting. I don't know if you've watched any like he, there's a thirty for thirty documentary. Oh on yes, him. yeah. But he's um he he also works at it too. I don't know if you saw that he was like he was. Uh, his archery yeah the archery with his feet did you ever see him doing wow, that i don't remember was, i don't remember the feet thing this was when he was doing rehab to try to get back into the game like wow. that was one of the things he would practice but anyway bo jackson yeah that's that's a whole different story um all right one of the things that maria said in this in this interview is don't judge me by my successes judge me by how many times i fell down and got back up which I love, by the way. And she says... It's a Nelson Mandela quote, I think. <clears throat> right. In fact, that's what she starts she, the book with. She was kind of... Yeah, she was mm -hmm. paraphrasing or, or trying to remember that quote. And that really resonated with her. And I want to ask you, does this connect in any way um, to your concept? I feel like you're judging yourself by having the guts to go out and pursue something big and then actually take steps toward executing it. Um, I would actually say those are pretty different. Okay. Um, so falling down and getting back up and letting that be the measure of your success is, is amazing. And I really, really hope is that inspirational concept that helps people develop grit. And when you realize that it was said by Nelson Mandela, which by, I'm reading his um, biography now. When I read that, in fact, it was that quote. I downloaded it that second. Read the quote that starts her book. Go download it onto um, Audible, and now I'm, I just started reading it yesterday. When you realize he's the one that said it after everything that he went through, I was like, 27 years in jail, man. That's yeah. fucking nuts. Yeah. And to walk out and be walking out and going, like, I have to let go of all my anger, all of my bitterness, if I'm going to be able to really lead people and do something incredible. So, yeah, man, that that's just like the weight of those words coming from that guy, I hope everybody really puts that at the center of their existence mm -hmm. because so many people are crippled by fear. And it's like, once you embrace, I'm going to embarrass myself. It's a foregone conclusion. 
I'm going to embarrass myself. I'm going to fail. People are going to make fun of me. They're going to laugh at me. And the only way to win is on a long timeline. The only way to win is to get back up every time, every time, every time. And there's the famous quote that I'd almost be a little surprised if somebody isn't already dropping into the comment section, which is fall down seven times, get up eight. <laughs> the problem is, of course, you can't get up more times than you fall down. Okay. So, um, but fall down seven times, get up seven times. That's very impressive. Yeah. So that's, it's it's so simple and it's so powerful. And the other one is, yeah, just the other concepts different. Okay. Um, yeah, and it seems like a lot of her happiness comes from, and I want to get your thoughts on this, it's less from actually winning the tournament and getting the trophy and more from knowing the amount of work that she put in to get there. It seems mm. like she takes a lot of pride. And she, she says in the interview... Um, you know, it's nice to look over and see that trophy next to your bed, but then you think about, you know, how tired you were and how sore you were and how many times you pushed through to get there. And that seems like she takes a lot of her, her like fulfillment really from. Dude, that's identity, man. Yeah. That is identity. That's where real fulfillment comes from. Because here's the thing, like imagine for a second, somebody attacks me. Like this always makes me laugh. Like when people come after me hard about diet. It's like, motherfucker, I lost 60 pounds. Like there's, and I've kept it off for almost a decade. Not quite, yeah, almost, fuck, it's almost a decade. That nice. is insanity. Congrats. Thank you. Okay. So it's like, what are you trying to tell me? It's like, I get it. There are other paths to heaven. Fantastic. But to say that what I'm saying doesn't make sense, like, are you retarded? I, I, I don't even understand the attack. It's like, dude, I'm not guessing. This is what I did. Mm -hmm. And so may, if your attack is it only worked once, great. But like it worked. So once something works, like all, all the hate in the world, if when you're by yourself, you're alone and your thoughts of who you are are positive, no one can touch you. No one can touch you. Conversely, if when you're out in the world and everyone is praising you and saying that you're amazing, but when you're alone, the fucking darkness comes for you and you know you're a sham, you've got nothing. Mm -hmm. The, I have the chills on my face. The only thing that matters is what you think about yourself mm -hmm. when you're by yourself. In those quiet moments, man. And that is, I have the chills on my face again. That is like all of your work should be about that. Like, Every day, am I doing the things? Like, I can't tell you how many times. Do you, I don't know why this week, for some reason, every morning, I'm like, it's 4.30 a.m. No one would know if I played video games right now. No one would know. <laughs> like, the, you guys would never know, yeah. right? It's just soft enough that if I spent a couple hours in the morning playing video games, as long as I wasn't sitting in there with the controller in my hand when you guys got here, like, nobody would know. I'm usually up for hours before Lisa gets up, so even she wouldn't know. But I would know. I would know that I'm not the person that I say I am. I'm not the person that I want to become. And so it's like, it, it's amusing to me the way that the impulse runs through my head because it's like Jesus like even this far into like my journey there's still that weak little voice that's like go ahead like it's right, okay sure. eat that right that happens to me all the time so I'm scary disciplined with my food and I will fucking walk by a bag of like uh tortilla chips or Doritos or a ding dong a piece of cake and it's like Go ahead, go ahead. Like nobody's looking, nobody will know. So it's really funny. But I'm so obsessed with feeling good about myself at 3.30 in the morning because every time I make the choice to be the person that I'll be proud to be, the next time it's 3.30 in the morning and it's the gut check of who I really am. That is the gift, like honestly, I want to give everybody. That is what this show is about. How do you get to the point where in those quiet moments, when you're all by yourself, that you're gonna feel really good about who you are, regardless of what anybody says about you. Because you've had every opportunity to be weak and you didn't take it. That's really powerful. And, and something that just came together for me, and I know you've been talking about this a long time, so I'm surprised that I'm just now getting it in this like level of clarity. But I think where a lot of people struggle is um, they break down or don't follow through because they don't have a super, super clearly defined identity or of, of who they want to be. 
So like you just said that you could do that, but the vision of yourself and what you say you are does not comply. Correct. And you know that these, these are specific things. You don't play video games at two hours in the morning. You don't eat that potato chip. And I think where a trap that people can fall into, and I think I've fallen into it too, is it's you have sort of a notion of who you want to be, but it's not that clearly defined. So it's easy to just rationalize little things here and there or to not even think about it and say this is okay when if you had that really clear roadmap, it, you would know it's not okay. It would just be an easy decision. Bright lines. Yeah. Bright lines. And here's why bright lines work. Because the second you cross over it, you don't get to feel good about yourself anymore. And this, man, I don't know if I'm doing a good job of externalizing it. Like, I don't know yet the words to put around. In fact, um, somebody, Michelle, I don't see Will. Is he hiding behind the column? Will, will you write this down for me? To write a thing about bright lines, like how to really explain this concept. Because... When you have bright lines and there are things that you either do or don't do, you trigger, and in fact, you have to get good at knowing how to reward yourself and knowing how to punish yourself because that's what makes all of this work is I really feel good at 3.30 in the morning by myself. When I make the right choice, it feels so good. And this is something that I've been trying to, it's come up a lot recently, is, oh, Tom, I don't have the motivation. Oh, Tom, like, um, I can't seem to find a passion. Like, what's the problem? The problem is you're not excited about anything. You're not excited about what's at the end of that rainbow. You're not excited, and fuck the rainbow. You're not excited about what is at the end of that very hard road that is before you. So there's nothing at the end of that that is worth going through all the things you're going through to get there. And so halfway through, you're like, why am I doing this? That's what fucking happened to me with money. I wasn't excited enough about money. And like, God, I, if you're that excited about money, then it might work. And all of my words may be total bullshit. I'm just coming from the place of it wasn't enough for me. I wasn't excited enough about money. Now, I found I was getting very excited about things that money could do. And once I started focusing on that, like, whoa, this is what I want to facilitate. This is a dream I want to make come true. Then it was, it was really easy for me to go fucking hard, to show up at all hours of the morning, to bust ass. Because there were very real, concrete, tangible people that I loved and cared about that I wanted to have an impact on. And whether that was mentally, physically, and those have been the two drivers of my life post-money were how do I help people physically that I know, love, and care about? And how do I help people mentally that I know, love, and care about? Like, change these things have a huge impact on their life. That is meaningful to me. And so that thing is exciting to me. The vision of becoming the person that I would need to become to execute against that is exciting to me. Knowing how to reward myself and quite frankly, fucking punish myself. For instance, and I'm gonna keep saying this out loud because I, am, I, I have not done what I needed to do to make good on something I said I was gonna do and that is not fucking okay for me. I said that we would have our first comic book by October 1st. I have a whole slew of excuses 31st. as to October 31st. Yes. Wow. I have even more time than I thought. Fuck. Maybe there's still a chance. <laughs> I moved the goalposts on myself. <laughs> That's such a me thing. Um, I still have time. I, uh, I might be able to pull it off now. Oh, okay. So fuck. Mm -hmm. You just really gave me a gift. When I thought I wasn't going to make it just to finish that thought, I was like, dude, I need to start confessing to this because I'm fucking this up and I'm not going to meet my deadline. And that isn't okay. That you have to be willing to punish yourself when you miss things to not feel good about that, to own up to the people that you respect and that you want to respect you and to tell them, look, I fucked up, which by the way is a long-term be respect, be respected strategy. In fact, I'm going to give a shout out. So this guy named Charlie, what's his real last name? He Hubert. goes, Hubert, Hubert. So Charlie Hubert from uh, instant charisma. charisma on command. Charisma on Command, thank you. It's a YouTube channel. Go to it now. He came here yesterday. He saw uh, the event that we came to the event that we did. Super fucking cool guy. Great guy. Came to the event. It was like, hey, I um, would love to give you some advice on your YouTube channel. 
I was like, dude, I'll take fucking a good idea from wherever I can get it. Comes out to the house, gives me this whole thing. I bring all that up because he has a video on Adele about how the way that she is so real and so authentic over the long run endears people. So even though it seems like she's kind of throwing herself under the bus all the time um, by just confessing to things that seem like they wouldn't make her seem cool, but they actually make her seem cooler. Uh, great video, go there, Charisma On Command, YouTube channel, super fucking rad. Uh, I have no affiliation with him other than he was really cool to us and came yesterday and gave us some really fucking great advice. And then I watched a shit ton of his videos and they're really good. Um, so go check them out. But when it's somebody that you want to respect you, you would think like positioning yourself to be cool, to always look cool um, is the right answer. And it's really not. Like mm. always owning it, always. There's no way after a year with me that people would be like, oh, he tries to sweep shit under the rug when he fucks up, he doesn't own it. Like I've... I fucking fall over myself to own when I have screwed up. And it is my belief that in the long run, that's going to be a win. And a lot of uh, psychologists and researchers have found that uh, people, people can't connect with you if you're, if you're perfect all the time, right? They, they actually connect with you more if you're fallible, if you make mistakes, which is super interesting. Super interesting. And now I'll shout out another person, Drama, the founder of Young and Reckless. If you guys don't already know him, go check it out. In fact, he really, I think he's released or he will be releasing soon. The talk that he gave at our event, uh, which was awesome. And the reason it was awesome is it was so relatable. And everyone in the audience was like, dude, like that guy made it feel so possible because he just walked people through like the hard things, the things he was nervous mm -hmm. about. Like you want to talk about somebody that came across super cool because he made absolutely no effort to be cool. Mm -hmm. So neat to see. Yeah. So neat to see. That's great. All right. Uh, we have a couple comments and shout outs coming in. We have Jim Quick in the comments. My boy. Dude, I was just obsessing over your social feed and totally missing you. Uh, we haven't gone for a burger in a distressingly long time. So got to hang out, homie. Also, I think we're speaking at the same event uh, tomorrow. I'm going tomorrow, but I fear he may not be going till mm. Saturday. But Thrive, Thrive. you're going to be in Thrive. You're going to be in Vegas. Check it out. But yeah. Jim is speaking there. He, he actually put a comment in and quoted you just now. The only thing that matters is what you think about yourself when you're by yourself. Hashtag wow. Nice. Thanks, there Jim. it is. Thanks, Jim. All right. Here's a question. This is one that I had, too, um, from Stacy Lee on Facebook. Thanks, Stacy. Her question is, Maria talks about repetition, repetition, repetition. It is so hard. I have a growth mindset, and I listen to you every day. I've tried so oh, hard multiple you. times to wake up at 5 a.m. to work out, meditate, think and take, et cetera. But after one week, I am just exhausted. Please shed some light on how to get over that one week hurdle. Oh, I love how this. do I develop a bigger why? Oh, That's well, now we just threw a monkey wrench. So those are two Let's very see. different questions. Let's the one that I, the first one. Yeah, the yeah. one that I haven't talked about much is it, it, it is mechanical. And this, I really, Jared, I really want people to hear me on this. All right. I fucking go to bed early. Yes. Right? So look, I get it. I get hero points because I'm posting in the gym at like 2.30 or 3.30 in the morning. But like, hashtag, I go to bed at nine. I go to bed at nine. I don't use an alarm. I wake up when I wake up. When I first made the transition to not using an alarm, I slept for an ungodly number of hours. So except that for a, probably a couple months, you're gonna sleep so much. So here's, here are my bright lines. If I've gotten more than five hours of sleep and I realize that I'm awake, meaning I'm not going to be able to fall back asleep easily because there are times you roll over and you realize, hey, I'm awake. I don't fucking look at the clock. If I feel tired, I'm like, I'm going to sleep. I fall back asleep. When I hit that point where I'm like, <laughs> I'm awake. Yeah. Then I look at the clock. And when I see the clock, oh, it happens to be 2.15 and I went to bed at 9. That's over five hours. So a 10-minute clock starts. I have 10 minutes to get out of bed, which, by the way, if I fall asleep in the 10 minutes, great. But I don't give myself more than 10 minutes. At the 10-minute mark, I'm up, I'm out of bed, and I attack my day. If I sleep for nine hours, fantastic. And it, you sleep until you don't need sleep. Like, yeah. guys, I cannot stress enough. If you're looking at me right now and you're saying, hey, whoa, like this guy has a lot of energy. Here is how I have a lot of energy. I prioritize sleep and I make sure that I have good, like my body can produce ATP. Okay? Mitochondria. I eat well, I exercise to make sure that I'm able to produce the energy that I need to do what I want to do. So take care of those two things, sleep, diet, exercise. 
If you do that, then you're not gonna be tired like you are right now. Living in a state of fatigue sucks. It's deeply unpleasurable, which is why, by the way, I stopped using an alarm so that I could get sleep. Uh, yeah, so stop using an alarm, go to bed very early, eat right, work out. You, you will be absolutely startled by how many problems that solves. That's awesome. I have a follow-up question. Please. So I feel like there's three types of waking up. There is the without an alarm. There is the Saturday morning you slept in, you got all the sleep you needed and you just wake up. There is the I'm really excited about something and so I wake up. And then there is the I'm really stressed about something and so I wake up. Which of those three do you find yourself most often in? Oh, most often. Yeah. Well, it really is cyclical. So I'll go through phases where, and it, it might be a week, two weeks where I'm fucking stressed. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, whoa, there's a lot going on. And for whatever reason, I don't feel good about my, either how much I'm accomplishing or that I have the answer of how to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And so that'll like wake me up. Um, the one that, uh, so to address all three, so there's that one, goes in cycles. The other one, I'm excited to get up. That's probably the one that I spend the most time in. Okay. And then I just got enough sleep. Um, that one to me is, the, the image that comes to mind is like it fills in all the cracks of the bricks in the wall between being stressed and being excited. So, and I'll clock those as the days where I get seven or more hours. So okay. that's relatively rare for me. And the, the irony is that I'm going to get less sleep on the weekends than I do on the week. Because on the weekends, it's the double whammy of I let myself go to bed late, but your, mm -hmm. your body clock is weird. You're, I find it's way easier to like push my schedule late, even though I'm going to wake up at the same time. Mm -hmm. So if I normally, let's say my schedule is anywhere from like 3 to 5 a.m., I'm still going to wake up at 5 even if I go to bed at midnight or one. So routinely on like a Friday night, I'll get four hours sleep. So actually it's more true on a Saturday because usually Friday, if I've had like a really long week, I'm, you know, still like 10, 10 30, I'm still going to bed. Um, whereas on a Saturday, I might stay up to one or two, but I'm still going to wake up at like five to six. And so at that point, you know, I'm getting like four hours sleep. So you're actually catching up during the week on your sleep. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Cause I, I definitely like my, all the bright lines and stuff that I talk about, like if I'm awake, I'm either working or working out. That is a Monday through Friday thing. Yeah. So on the weekends I still work, but I only do work that's pleasurable. I prioritize time with my wife, especially on Saturdays. So it's like, there's, it, it's a different set of rules for the weekend that I don't often go into, but. Interesting. All right, uh, I think we should give away a couple copies of Maria's book. I think book. that is a very good idea. This is her book, Unstoppable, it's brand new. You can win it. Uh, we'll give a copy away on YouTube, we'll give a copy away on Facebook. Why don't you post in the comments what you learned from the interview from Maria Sharapova? Something specific and we'll choose one in each. and We'll give you the book. Nice. We'll send it to you. I cool. like that. All right, uh, let's see here. So I wanna talk about her competitiveness. Um, it seems she has this instinctive competitive edge and it seems like it comes naturally to her. She's used it very powerfully in her career. Do you think people who aren't naturally competitive should try to cultivate that quality. Definitively, without question, right now, start immediately. As a kid, because I always felt weak and stupid, I never tried to be competitive. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the only thing that I was ever really competitive about was putting on my seatbelt faster than anybody else <laughs> because they didn't know they were playing. So <laughs> if I won, I would announce that we were playing the game, and if nice. I lost, then we just weren't playing. Love like that. that really contextualized me for a minute in terms yeah. of what I was like as a kid and how far I've come from that, which I, know, I really want people to understand that so that they recognize that like wherever they're at, and I don't care if you're 65, like wherever you're at, there's always time to change your behavior to be more advantageous, right? And that's, that's how to think of it. It is not invalidating your life up to that point. There's always a more advantageous way to be in every day. I'm trying to be a little bit better and more efficient, more advantageous. So... I hope that people see I did not start as like 
this guy, he's going to be the guy that goes on to be successful. It was just, I was so deeply unsatisfied with where I was, I could get better. So I think that one of the things that I've cultivated is that competitive drive and to really like own it, which by the way, one of the things that really brought this out in me was video games, playing first person mm -hmm. shooters and knowing I'm playing against real people. And I remember so when internet was like not great, so I, I like never quite could figure out how people are playing against other people. My internet speed wasn't fast enough to really do it. So like my first sort of stumbly forays into that were very awkward. And I was like, this is dumb. I don't know why people do this. And so I just kept playing against a computer, computer, computer. And then I don't remember what made me go like, I really want to try this. I want to play against the other people. And so I tried it and I fell in love because by then I had a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And by then I thought, wait a second, I'm really, really bad. You can't imagine how bad I was where it was like, at first, all I was trying to do was not panic when I saw another player on my radar. Okay. Like not even, you can't even see him on your screen. Just seeing that they were getting close to me would create this like sense of panic. And so I thought, Hey, this is a great way to practice, like getting out of the sympathetic nervous system into the parasympathetic nervous system. And then it was like, I'm really bad at this and it's quite embarrassing. And they do what's called teabagging in video games where their little character, literally, if you know what teabagging is, they're, they're teabagging your dead corpse. Yeah. Right. And I, and it would like really wind me up. <laughs> and so I'm like, motherfucker. So then it was like, okay, how do I just not get annoyed at that? And how do I like practice, get better, like keep my calm. And all of a sudden I was like, this is all the things that I've spent learning in business. This is a proxy for it's a real person. They're being flagrant. They're being cruel. They're being dismissive and like all the things that are going to trigger you in a business setting. Yeah. Like, Hey, here's my opportunity. One to not let it get under my skin because it diminishes my performance. So practice not letting it get to me to practice getting out of the sympathetic into the parasympathetic. And then remember, you can get better at anything. And so watching myself by practicing and saying, hey, this is what I'm gonna do. And I remember I once got randomly paired with this guy and he, we were talking and, and I don't remember why, but he was like, oh, I have this dot on the center of my TV. And I'm like, why do you have a dot on the center of your TV? And he said, oh, I'm trying to get better as a sniper and I need to memorize right where the, when you pull the aim button, right where it's gonna be so that I know how to like where the, the to put the person's head so that it's a headshot and kill. And I was like, dude, you are my kind of guy. Like, you're not just playing tonight, you're practicing. Mm. And I said, full respect for that. So anyway, yes, triggering, like learning things like competitiveness can be really, really advantageous. There is a whole slew of them, which I should probably write down. That's one of them. How can it be dangerous? Well, anything that you let corrode you, anything where it's like you're not advancing fast enough that you can't have fun unless you win, um, where I hear people say like, oh, I wouldn't even play a game if I can't win. Why the fuck? Like that doesn't even make sense to me. Yeah, I don't understand that. So winning is is awesome. Yep. Winning, especially in sort of the context of life, is I think important. Um, but it's a little crazy to me. People that can't control their emotions and so they can't even go into a game where it's like, oh, I might lose. And they're so wound up. Like, how then do you ever get good? Like, do you only play the things where it's like you're already the best person or do you find people that are weaker than you? Like, it, it's a losing strategy, right? To, to only go against people that you can beat. It's like Maria Sharapova playing against kids that were older than her all the time, all yeah. the time is upping her game. And you hear that a lot, like, kids that had older brothers. And it was like, man, by the time I was actually playing with, you know, football with kids my own age, it was like, Jesus, this is easy. Or boxers, you know, same thing. It's like, God, I was always fighting with my older brothers. In fact, I think that Sugar Ray um, Leonard had exactly that story, if I remember right. He was like the youngest. And so it was like, God, I'm getting slapped around. And admittedly, I'm hoping that you're not, is that I'm not misremembering this. I think that's um, right. But that, that yeah. seems right. And so it was like, by the time I was fighting kids my own age, I could just manhandle them. So it's like, yeah, but if he had been like, oh, I don't want to do this because my brothers are bigger and stronger than me, then which would have been my tactic, by the way. Um, yeah, it's just that that is but one of, I'm sure, multiple ways that it could be dangerous. Do you ever play video games with a person back in the day that would uh, turn the game off right before they lost? Do you ever have that? No, but people do that in Destiny. They'll, oh, they they'll drop offline. If they're yeah, losing, yeah. they're like, there's no way we can win. Yeah. Cause they don't, I don't know if it, and I, I'm not even sure if this works, but I don't know if they think it keeps it from, cause you, there's, you get an ELO score, dude. What's that? That's how they rank chess champions. 
So what is this? The in chess, uh, I don't. Okay. In chess, it's like based on who you've beat, who they've beat, and so like if you beat them, like by proxy, then like you've beat other people, and so okay. like it all adds up to this ELO score. And there's like a way where you get points or lose points. I don't, I don't remember. I looked this up once because it really mattered to me for a red hot minute when I first started like really trying to be competitive at Destiny, and I was obsessed. Like, what's my ELO score? Is it going up or is it going down? But then I just realized within the limited amount of time I give myself to play it. Ah, really getting a good yellow score, I'd have to really dedicate myself. Yeah. And I was just like, hey, I'm not gonna do that. So I stopped looking at it. But so yeah, that that stuff is, it, it's amazing how detailed all of that gets. Why? Yeah. I don't remember why I brought up yellow score. Do you? Uh, because you were saying that people turn, they drop offline. Yeah, so I don't know if they're thinking it, that it stops them from <laughs> taking that hit, but I think you take it anyway. Interesting. Um, I want to go deeper into the notion that repetition leads to discipline and really get your thoughts on this, um, the relationship between those two things. And then if there's a hack that will help you create more discipline. So here's how I think that they go together. You need a little bit of one to get the other. So I'd really have to stop and think about like, what's that catch 22? In fact, I already know the answer. So um, if you don't have at least a little bit of discipline to start really pushing yourself in the repetition, you're not excited enough about the thing that awaits you, right? So okay. she loved tennis. So she yep. wanted to get good at tennis. She loved winning. So she wanted to make sure that she was winning at tennis. So that gave her that impetus that she needed to do the repetition. But then the more you do it, the better you get at it. And so recently, a lot of people have been asking me about ADD and hmm. the way that I have combated my, um, my, I won't, I, I don't know that I actually have ADD, but for sure, especially when I'm dealing with contracts, I just, fuck, like my attention just wants to go everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And I found in the beginning, dude, I, here's what's hard about contracts. And this is what makes me want to punch lawyers, like as a, an ecosystem, <laughs> they're an entire paragraph this long of like small fucking font will be a single sentence yeah. with parentheticals oh, yeah. and like weird words that you've never heard before. And I'm like, guys, you're fucking stressing my working memory here. So working memory is the things that you can hold like in your head is how we think of it. I can hold it in my head while mm -hmm. I do the math mm -hmm. or while I read the contract. And I, if it were more than two lines, I couldn't and my attention would wander and I would find myself reading the same sentence over and over. And so finally, I was like, as soon as I noticed my attention was wandering, bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. And then it was like, oh, I can do three sentence, or three lines. Oh, I can do four. Oh, I can do a whole paragraph. Oh, I can do the paragraph, look up the word, come back, still know where I'm at, still hold it all in my head. And I was like, whoa. The, when I think back to what it was like when I first started reading contracts, it is insanity. Yeah. So that's just from, oh, I've wandered, come back. I've wandered, come back. And the more you force yourself, repetition, to do that over and over and over, suddenly you just realize, oh, the, like, the duration of time before I have the impulse to either stop or that I've noticed that I've drifted off and I'm thinking about something else, they just get longer and longer and longer. And to a hack perspective, so with contracts, it's very different. So I won't say that this works for tennis, but with contracts, headphones, a certain type of music that has like a certain like driving um, tempo, no lyrics, and furrowing my brow. Hmm. All of that fucking arrows me in on what I'm trying to do. Now, if I were going to be doing tennis, I would do similar things with furrowing my brow. I'd tilt my chin down, which is weird. I didn't notice that until I did it to you to replicate what I normally do, um, which I find how I hold my head really affects my meditation. Really? Just throwing some weird shit out there right now. Um, okay. So like this versus this will affect me dramatically differently when I meditate in terms of like a sense of peace and calm. You know, I've actually heard weird. meditation guides say like, make sure you like, bring your chin down. Really? Yeah. I have I, never yeah. fucking heard that, I've but heard that is that. so my experience. Because I do guided meditation. So they'll That's walk you through some fucking things. Like, hold your back this way, you know. So. Weird. Yeah. That's really weird. I'm super freaked out right now. So I don't know why. I don't know why. I've also just randomly, while we're talking about head position, I've heard if you're in a dream and you wake up, but you want to get back to the dream, stay in the exact position that you were laying in. Whoa. That's good no, to know. Not a dream guy. You don't want to get back into it. Yeah, good point. Um, so that's, yeah. So oh, there was a second part to the repetition thing. You were going to the brain hacks. Hacks. So that yeah. was the hack. Yeah, yeah. So that's it. Cool. So you, you have lawyers to thank as well then, it sounds like. Jared, I so respect that framing and I'm so grateful for that. Yes. 
They've right. made me stronger. There you go. Do you know what hormesis is? No. A little bit of toxicity is usually good for the system. Okay. The dose makes the poison, right? Like, so there's like actually a curve. Or vaccines. Yee. I, I think so. I'm not 100% okay. that that's how vaccines work just because I'm ignorant to that. But that sounds right from the limited amount that I know about vaccines where they give you like a weak inversion. Yeah. So ah, it might be a little different because okay. of the, the immune system recognizes it and it's too fucking weak to put up a fight. Whereas like if you spray a little bit of Roundup on a plant, which will fucking annihilate it at bigger doses. So you'd think, well, it should be toxic at any dose. At a low dose, the plant plant will actually grow more. Hmm. So it's uh, kind of weird. But it has to be like a really low dose. So uh, uh, do they use? I think this is an example that's often used um, for. Oh, and this one I know fasting. Fasting is used as an example for hormesis. Too mm, much, you die, yeah. but just enough. And you're, you go into this, what they call a hormetic effect, where your body goes in and evaluates cells and goes, can I break this one apart? Because I'm not getting anything into the system. So you look a little old. You, look, uh, you have senescence. You, maybe you're precancerous. So fuck you. You're not good for the system. I'm going to break you apart and use your constituent parts for something else. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons that fasting is so awesome. And people should do more fasting. Nice. Please understand the difference between fasting and being anorexic, which are very different things. Um, and yeah. Anorexia is like a real fucking thing, and I have nothing but compassion and empathy for people that are in anorexia, but that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. All right. We have a few minutes left, so I want to give away our books at this time. Will or someone, can we choose someone from YouTube only because the YouTube comments disappear after the live? So I want to make sure that we mm. acknowledge that they've won. Find the right person. Choose someone. The, uh, the question was something that you learned from the episode from Maria. Be specific and we will send you this book. We'll make sure to connect with you on YouTube and also Facebook as well. We're gonna choose one winner there, so. Okay. Uh, all right, my final question, I guess, or we'll see how many we get through, are, is around her notion of when she enters the tennis court, like her mental state changes. When she goes into the locker room, that is her office. And that really resonated with me both from a perspective of like having played sports and I know like you sort of get into a different mental state when you go into the, go onto the field or mm -hmm. wherever it is. And also in the way that I think about my job right now, I know we've talked about this a little bit, like I come in, I have a different work mode than I do a uh, play mode or a mm -hmm. home mode. Right. And, but you seem to be much more fluid with work and life. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, can you, 100%, but reframe the question. What are you actually asking me? I want to know, um, first of all, what are your thoughts on that, of her sort of having those very two mm. black and white mm. different states? Because it resonates with me, but I don't think it's something that you employ very much. With work. Correct. So they're like uh, very much so I'm indifferent. Uh, my wife would vehemently disagree right now. Mm. So she would say you definitely have work mode. So between, I may not so much between work and play, but I do between, um, leader and husband. Uh, so that, that, those are wildly different for me. Um, and that's actually really fun. I'm sort of in my head putting myself in her shoes. In fact, she's just wandered over because she's like, look, motherfucker, you better tell some truth right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, so those are very, very different. And she'll, one of the things that she hits me up with on the weekend is you're in work mode right now. Uh, and, and I will say that work mode for me is marked by deadly efficiency. Yeah. And it's one thing I don't think people realize about me, like my fucking obsession with efficiency. Um, and I'm, so putting myself in your shoes right now, I know there are times where I'm having what my wife would call a waffle, like where it's, hey, like I just want to hear what's going on in people's lives. We're joking around. We're on a tangent. Um, but that is because I think that is one of the most important things that you can have in a company. You have to have real bonds based on emotion. Yeah. And I learned that lesson the hard way. So that to me is, is really critical and is a part of being an efficient team is that. But like... When it comes to, if we were talking about something and I know that we're pressed for time or whatever, holy fuck. 
Like the only thing that stops me from, from just like, dude, get to the point is that I know I damage relationships, mm -hmm. but like inside my head, I'm like, Oh God, like we are fucking pressed for time, boys and girls, we need to move. And so my wife knows me so well that like the slightest like twitch at the corner of my eye and she'd be, she feels it. So that's when she's like, stop trying to like her whole thing. She likes to tell really fucking long stories. People must be like jumping out of their skin. Like, motherfucker, you tell the longest stories ever. <laughs> but like with the most tangents. But on the like weekend, if I'm like, I'm giving my wife that look like, okay, I get it. Like get to the point. She, she reminds me that's work mode. It's very okay in work mode. It's very much not okay in play. So I think it's relatively inevitable that anybody that's really trying to play at a high level is going to have different modes. Um, one thing I would encourage you as the hardest to read human on the planet, I've never encountered a human being more difficult to read than you. That's like one thing that would benefit you, I think is actually bringing more, a, a little more play mode to the table Yeah, because your I'm, team, I'm sensing that. your team, especially dude, when like, if you're riding them really hard and they don't have a connection to you as like the the surfer Jared who like loves it. And I bet has really fucking fascinating thoughts when you see a dolphin and like, you know, and, but really, right. Yeah, so that they feel like they it. know a different side of yeah. you. And every now and then when something really catches you off guard and you fucking do that laugh, that like patented Jared laugh where I can tell, like you were so surprised by whatever just happened and you, you straight guffaw. Yeah. It, I love seeing that. And it, it definitely makes me feel more connected to you for sure. Cool. So that, that ended up being a super weird response to that. But Super weird, but helpful for me. Thanks for uh, the <laughs> on-air feedback. Hope you guys enjoyed it. <laughs> um, Which is Jared's nightmare, by the way. No, it's so, fine. It's fine. But you're not a big um, fan of public feedback, right? If I remember correctly, from our Captivate time. Yeah, this feels different. I don't know why. Okay, Yeah. cool. I feel connected to the community, you guys. So, nice. okay. Um, we got to give this book away and wrap it up. We'll, Let's do it. Will has slacked me. The winners, we have Robert Ramirez from YouTube. Robert Ramirez. You won. Unstoppable. Make sure you email us today. Yes, please email mm. connect at impacttheory.com so that we can connect with you and get your address so we can send this to you because we actually have the books in-house. And then uh, do we have one for Facebook or we'll connect with them later? Anyone? Kids? Will? Beautiful. Do we have one for Facebook? Uh, Facebook, since we can hold on to your comments, we'll find you later. Yes. We'll see someone. We'll hit you up. Yep. We're going to wrap it up now. All right. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a lot of fun. Um, as always, man, I'm grateful to you for the questions and all the work that you do coming into the episodes. Absolutely fantastic. I love You're that. Welcome. So thank you. And uh, guys, reminder about the contest. So in the description right now is a link. Be sure you send your friends to that. Get them to subscribe to the channel and then leave your name in the comments of that video. And the more people you get to do that, the more entries you have into the contest, which is going to be going till October 13th. So keep sending, keep sending, keep sending. That would be amazing, amazing. Um, and I'll be in New York this coming Thursday. And hopefully I will see any of you New Yorkers there. We will be posting the location on my Facebook page. So keep your eyes peeled. And if you're interested, go to the Eventbrite um, what, what do we call that link? I guess I don't know a better yeah. word for it. Yeah. And uh, let us know that you're going to be there because that's going to determine the venue. All right, guys, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care.